So Guy Farmer writes the music for this podcast, but we're going to talk to him about loss and ADHD and emotion. And I know a lot of you are going through a situation where maybe you're about to lose your dad, your mom, whoever it is. And honestly, I can't imagine what, what that feels like. So we're going to talk to Guy about it right now because Guy's one of my best friends and it is one-on-one live. So cheers, mate. Hey, man. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Always a pleasure. <laughs> so, so what is it like? Well, okay. So my dad passed away in November. Um, you know, I don't feel like I lost him. I knew him for 40 years. It was a blessing. And um, he had uh, a lot of health complications about 10 years ago. And that just took a lot out of him. And then over the years, there was a a couple of things transpired from those earlier health um, uh, issues. And his body just gave out at the end. You know, he lived to be 81 years old. And, um, and uh, I, it was, I, I spent every day with him, you know, because I, my family, I lived with my family and um, I would go to the hospital, like just be in the hospital, like every year, like maybe like two or two or three stints, maybe just a day, maybe three weeks. And um, I was the one in the family that would go and like hang out and because um, I was working for my family at the time. So I could like take off work to go do that easily. And um, so like my finger was really on the pulse when it came to his health. And it also like, and I didn't need that experience to remind me that like, because I love this dude. We're really, we're really good. We're really good right. friends. Like to remind me like, hey, talk to him every day. Make sure everything's said. Of course, it it did kind of like remind me. And so we did. We I talked about more things with him than I probably would have if that hadn't happened. I I dragged stuff out of him to learn about <laughs> about his. It's like when he, when I was born, like I never met his dad. And his mom passed away before he even married my mom. And he has no siblings or cousins. So right. his family was my mom's family. So um, I'm trying to like, get the information out of him. And like all he can give me is my town in West Virginia. I grew up in had one stoplight. I'm like, you're running out of stories, bro. Yeah. My biggest thing is what does that feel like? Okay. Well, we lost a good friend of ours when we were 17, 18 years old. We did. And it wasn't a dad. It wasn't a dad, but I can say that, I, like, I don't think we were prepared for it then. And and I don't think you can ever really be prepared for it because of the emotions. What I'll say is, listen, if if you have a family member or a friend and they're near death, uh, you just have to talk to them. And, 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 and I wouldn't, like... Uh, from my experience, like, I didn't have anything I needed to bring up and, and, and clear over because we were 100. But when that person passes away, there's something that you do to yourself. And this is my advice to everybody. If when you lose a family, a, a parent or somebody really close to you for about 72 hours, you're going to be thinking, what did I not, what did I not say? What did I not say? What did I left undone? Now, That's if you can come scared. up with four or five things that you left unsaid in those 72 hours, that you did pretty good. After 72 hours, anything you come up with that you left unsaid, you're just torturing yourself. You're coming like it, they weren't that important. They didn't need. Now you're just torturing yourself. So my advice to people is to just give yourself 48 or 72 hours to think and then just be done with it. Like, don't worry, because after that, you're just inventing but, things. But, so we had another one of our friends, uh, Mike, uh, who is that? passed away recently. was it pretty uh, uh so no it, no okay. uh, like it was he called and said basically i have to get married on christmas eve because my dad has like a week wow left. and so i me my wife drove down there and when i walked into the room it was it was this somber experience I, but i asked him i said like are are you okay and he goes no my my schedule is shifted. <laughs> yes, which you're okay. Good question. Well, I gave him a hug. <laughs> I know. But uh, but the thing is, he is like that. He yeah. is Irish Catholic. He is going to throw a joke no matter what. Like, even if he's on his deathbed. Yeah. And when I talked to Mike, what he said was, like, this was a gut punch. To the point where, like, 
I I just I, I don't I can't explain how this is. Uh no, what was he when this happened? Because I was 40 when this happened in my and that Right. So Mike is 40 and his dad was oh, the I, same age. But when did his dad pass? About three years after years. Oh really? Okay. I'm not saying that so, minimizes his his no group. no I'm no. just saying like um it's basically like he, got he explained years. it in a way that I didn't understand, which was basically like, it's like being punched in the stomach over and over and over again. But yet you're crying at the same time. Like, I, I want to know how that okay. feels. I'll tell you like, the, the, the most. So like why I said the reason that the reason I said that I, I was the one that was going up there a lot is um, my mom has her business and she is working really hard at it. My sister is a teacher. And so she couldn't just take off. I was working for the family business. So I could just, I could just take off and then work through the morning. Yeah. It, and somebody needed to go cause he would never eat the hospital food. So I would take <laughs> twice a day and he wanted, he loves it. He, he always wanted me to tell him jokes. He wanted me to cheer him up. So I did. And we go up there and watch games and stuff that he wanted to watch. And I'd take him the stuff he liked. But um, when, when it was getting towards the end to yeah. where like, I was like, uh uh-uh. And every time he was in the hospital, it was like, uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. And so after about eight years of this, I realized, okay, when he goes into the hospital, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Like, and so this last time that he was in, he was in there for two weeks before he got moved to um, hospice. And at that point, I had a new job working in my uh, medical marijuana industry. So like I couldn't just take off willy nilly while he was in the hospital. I could, when he got moved to the hospice, they, they let right. me off. But, um, so I was preparing for the marathon because yeah. they, the last I talked to him when he was the most lucid before, um, he was, that was the last I talked to him before he was like out, um, yeah. like not conscious ever again. Right. So I talked to him and the hospital staff had said, you're not going to be able to go to Brooks to rehab because we can't discharge you and you don't meet their criteria. And then they came in like the next day and they said, you meet the criteria and you can go. And I'm like, yes. So I went back to work and I'm like, all right, now Brooks is going to be the marathon. Right. And so like, I, so Brooks so, rehabilitation right, combined that's, with that's the marathon. The, yeah. the, the, God, that's going to be a month. Uh, oh of, of, of me and my God. mom and my sister yeah. having to go not having but going up there to help them out so i was prepping for the marathon right and then all of a sudden like i had this surgery in november and after my 10-day follow-up i go to start the car i mean a, a different hospital and I, <laughs> yeah. I got a text from my mom and it said you need to come to the hospital your dad's been to the hospice but you know what i sat there with like like, like after he passed I was sad, of course. I lost my dad. I still am sad about it. But like the the hardest part for me was seeing him sick and not knowing how I was going to feel when he did pass, right? And then when he did pass, it was very. First of all, the people that work in hospice are saints. Let me. The people that work in hospice are amazing people. And if you have a family, like, like they made it. They made what was the most difficult thing for me because. You know, they he was supposed to like live another forty eight hours, right? And so my mom had the flu, and my sister had been up there for an hour or two. Kids and the kids can't be in there, and my mom was only allowed thirty minutes because she had the flu. And so I go in, and they're like, "I was going to spend the night." And by the way, hospice rooms, if you're if you're not like the the patient, they're pretty damn nice. It's was like really? a hotel, yeah. <laughs> I had a I had a mellow mushroom pizza delivered to me. Like I was like, I'm I'm with my daddy's in hospice. I played the card. Um and um I'm glad you have a sense of humor about it. Of course this. I do. And my dad we my dad it's, listen, my dad understood my humor when 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 I played him a Jim Jeffrey sketch. The Jim right. Jeffrey sketch where he takes the uh MS friend of his to a brothel. So the last so I, I was playing that for him because he thought it was funny. And when he laughed at that, that's when I realized, okay, he gets my humor now. And that was like, so like, so that I, was always, a bonding thing. I always appreciated like, that with Jim Jeffries. Yeah, so absolutely. I played that, it was 24 minutes and and then it ended. And I was like, hey dad, he was unconscious that I was talking to him. And they said that they could, that he could hear and I, I'm not a religious guy and he wasn't either. And I, 
And I really don't believe that you could hear me, but I did say, that's over. I'm going to like run off. I just had surgery and I had to go outside and smoke a cigarette and, um, and uh, take some pain medication for my, my surgery. And I said to him, I was like, hey, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes. All right. He didn't respond. He was unconscious. I was like, 15 minutes, I'm going to be back. Kissed him on the head and told him I love I walked out the door. I turned around. I came back in. I said, hey, like I said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. I love you so much. I gave him another kiss on the head. And I said, I'll be back in 15. What I was doing was I was kind of giving him like permission to check, to, to, to go. Like, 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 hey, if you want to hang on and hang out, I'll be back. So I went outside. And I had a cigarette and I called my mom and I was like, yeah, I got a pizza delivered. Um, it just got here. I'm going to go. Up. I got up there and I. I got up there and I took a bite of that pizza. It was delicious. And um, a nurse came in and she. Like did like kind of a like a little check that felt like she was checking out how he was doing. She gave me this weird look, and then she left. And a, like a head type, a doctor came in, and she checked him and said, looked at me and said, um, she said he's he's gone. And I said, you mean he's dead? What? And um, all of a sudden. All of this, like, like terrifying, mixed ter like, like, like emotions of, of, of just being terrified, scared about like how I'm going to feel about this. I wasn't happy, of course. I was distraught, but it was over. I was never going to get any more bad news about his health. He was not going to suffer anymore. I know that my dad was afraid of dying. I know that. And we're not re religious people. So like, right. I never heard him mention heaven. I never heard him say, I'll be with my mother. I'll see you in heaven. So it's, it wasn't, it's not like that. But like, he was afraid of dying. But I think towards the end, he wasn't um, from what my mom said. And so I was, I'm really happy. Of course, I'm happy that I was there. But um, they were like, well, we'll call your mom and your sister for you. And I was like, no. No, that's not the right yeah. So I called my, my my mom first. And I mean, that was the hardest call I had. So that was, and then I you was the only one. Then? Yeah, because like they were there all day. And then I came up to stay during the night. Because like I said, we were preparing, like they said, to be 48 hours. So that's not a yeah. marathon. It's just like, like, and I had, they gave me work off, but like, well, no I was, shit. I was, they came I was the yeah. overnight shift. And then we would all be there like that last day, right? So like 45 minutes, like an hour and 45 minutes after they left, I, I went down, got my pizza and my cigarette and, and came back up. I'm going to say this and I'll and, and keep it in. I, I don't know if he passed away when I was downstairs or, not, or if he passed away when I got back. But I know that I did it. I know that I gave him the permission, <laughs> but I feel kind. Of, I felt really weird about it because I was like, "Man, I wasn't there." But but I can't make myself feel bad about that because I didn't feel bad about that then because I had other things going on, right? right. So now I'm just gonna pick and choose things to feel sad about, like is being adopted, and yeah. like like you know how that feels like to have the kind of dad I had and to be adopted, like. He didn't. I, I, he didn't get my mom pregnant. My mom and dad didn't get pregnant. They had a baby. They tried and tried. They wanted a son really bad, Same and then they line. adopted my sister, and then they wanted a son. So I was very wanted by them yeah. and very loved by them. Yeah. And you know how hard it is to like fathom. That's why I can't have children. Like because my dad yeah. didn't miss practices. I apologize for the break. However, it is very important to me to mention my biggest diehard fans in every episode. To you Patreon subscribers, you are the only reason I can continue to do this. This podcast is proudly supported by Terry Shubilla, Leo Guinan, Kirk Hofstrom, Casey Elliott, Sarah Delano, Justin Allingham, Blushing Crafter, Jamie Young, and Beth Jones. If you want to join this insanity behind the scenes look at this podcast, go to the Patreon page. It's, it's fun. So I love you all so much. Thank you for always supporting me.
it means more than you know. This is you were playing basketball and you crashed, literally crashed into. And then a Dennis Rodman would save you all. And I was sitting next to your dad and he goes, you all right, guy? <laughs> like, like, from that moment on, I was like, I like this motherfucker. My dad life. was a chill, was a really chill dude. And my relationship with him was very unique and very rad. And uh, my relationship with my mom is very unique and very rad. And I'm so... I love them both so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're so sweet. I know. I'm so like, lucky. like, this is the thing. Like, I'm so lucky. And, like, <laughs> there's been times when, like, I, they've wanted to, like, you know, like, you know, kick me in the face. And, and, and the feeling's been neutral. But that's what love <laughs> is. Uh, with the thing that I was telling, I'm telling you, I'm trying to tell other people, and this might not apply to you. And, and, and if so, I apologize. But it's something to, to wrap your head around. I've given advice to some other friends who, Parents just got diagnosed with like stage four, oh God, cancer. Right. And they came to me and I was like, listen, like some of them came to me and they were like, I'm the one in the family that always fixes everything, like the older sister, like, and I can't fix this. And I was like, honey, nobody expects you to fix this. This is not fixable. All you need to do is be there for your family members. You need to be there. For, you need like, you need to get everything said. Now, if there's some like negative, crazy stuff, in yeah, that, maybe yeah. we need to leave that out. We know, like, he knows, you know, you're there, like, it's cool. But I'm telling you that I feel like this is the hardest part for you. I know that you're, I know your mother and your father, yeah. and I know that they're very proud of you and that they love you very they much. Are. And yeah. that I've seen you, like, go from sixth grade through um, through high school to, through, to, to here. And I can tell you that your mom and dad are super proud of you. They love oh, you very much, and they're really proud of you. Like, yeah. the person no, that are. you were, yeah. the person you've become, and the person you're gonna be, like anybody who knows you is proud of you. Like, like you're the one that everybody loves. You know, like you, you don't have any enemies. Um, like I'm talking about, like when we were in school together and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. I, exactly. like, like out in the real world. Whoa, just, just, yeah. you know, don't take him to Bourbon Street. So basically, what I'm saying, just to sum up, is we are all entitled to our emotions. So I'm not telling anybody how to feel about this. And I was like, oh. When they told me, I was like, okay, okay, I need to call my mom because that's some, they, they can't tell her and I need to call her. Like, so I, I didn't really think about like how I felt. I felt like what I needed to take care of because um, the last thing he said to me when he was really lucid before hospice was take care of your mom. He didn't mean financially. Right. He knows that I'm not like going to be able to do that. <laughs> ADHD. What, yeah. what he meant was, what he meant just be there for her. Like, no, be, and that's, that's, and so like your parents, I mean, some people have crazy parents that, that did not do them justice, but in general, most of us, most of our parents really do love us and, yeah. and, and you need to love them too. And then when, things go wrong and, or, or things go bad and someone passes away. You don't have things that were left unsaid. Everything was covered. And then you don't have to torture yourself about what you didn't leave unsaid. But again, I just want to double back on this. 48 to 72 hours after a loved one or especially a parent, somebody really close passes, you are going to have these thoughts in your head about what did I leave, what did I leave unsaid? Oh my God. And it's okay if there are two or three or four things because honestly, there aren't really going to be more. But after the 48, 72 hours, that's when your mind is going to start being really mean to you and start saying, like, there's times when my dad had come in my bedroom when I was a kid and, and threw things away, like a set list that I got off the stage from Blues Traveler that was signed by the band. It looked like a piece of trash. He threw that away. And I, and I yelled at him and screamed at him. I don't feel bad about that now. That happened a long time ago. But in fact, fun story, I got Farmer the third in 2010, I, along with my dog Roger B. Farmer, who passed away in 2016. We are still banned from Omni Hotels, along with Blue Strata. We, we were in the hotel or bar until four and they closed it too. So they served us until four. Then we went up to the room and, and, and so the alarm went off at 5 a.m. So we were getting, we were, I was acting like nothing happened, hey, man, I'm just leaving. And they knew it was us. And they were about to have us like arrested. And I was like, excuse me, there's video footage of y'all serving us 
till 4 a.m. And I think that the DOHs would have a problem with that. Yeah, smart. So what smart. I think we need to do is just <laughs> ban us from coming back, comp us for the rooms. Yeah. And um, and smart. that way we won't. That's smart. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened. No but, shit. but my dad went to, to try to stay in an army until like 10 years ago or like seven years ago. And I, 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 was, I was like, hey, you're not going to get in. He's like, oh, no, I booked a room. And I'm like, no, no, no. There you like, go. And then I had to tell Dream up. I had to tell my mom that the other day, like not the other day, like a year ago, she went to Atlanta with me, and I'm like, y'all aren't going to stand at the Omni. And she's like, no, why? Right, we're going to a double tree. And I'm like, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> why? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Dad knows. If there's one thing that you could say to your father right now, because I, I'm a huge believer that people that pass away look down. Like I, I do. Like I, I believe that. Like okay. this is my belief. Sure. What would you say to? Me? Okay. Well, I don't believe that. But I'm going to answer your question. And, I like I, I, that's fine. But and, what and, would you and, say? And, and, <laughs> let me just be clear. Like when I say I don't believe that. Like yeah. Uh, when I say I'm not religious, I'm not anti-religious. I respect. Yeah. It, that my tattoo this is. I respect the thing. Lord that lives in the heart of all men because religion is real. Yeah. It is real. It's just I'm not that way. My dad was that way. But if that was the situation, what I would say to him is I would probably tell him, um, I don't know, let's see, I would probably tell him this new joke that I have. Because I awesome. bounce, I bounce I, jokes. I love that. See, I would go into his bed, see, he got it. I would tell him jokes. And there are some jokes that I would tell him that like, because I can say anything to him. Right. And and not be like, I'm joking, I'm kidding. Like, like I'm not really like that. You know what I mean? Because he knows I was joking. We have the same, like, he knows me. And so, I mean, I'd be like, hey, I got this joke. And I'd, okay. I'd have okay. to close the door and tell Fair him. Enough. And, like, he'd be yeah. like, you, you can't tell that one. I'm like, I know. Like, just <laughs> telling, you, telling you that, I feel like some of my soul died. Um, And she's so like, yeah, you can't tell that joke, but what's the title of it? And I told him the title, and he goes, that's the joke. Just the title of the joke. Yeah. Acting it all out and, and isn't really funny, but the title of the joke is funny. I can't say the title of the joke. But like I bump I you know, I love like dirty humor and, and dark humor and bouncing it off him. And you know, I'd be sitting on the back porch having a cigarette and chilling. He would come out, we'd talk, listen to good music. You know, he's we did good music and uh yeah. He was my he was you know, people say their dads are the best friend. He wasn't my best friend. Um, like, right. He was my dad, and we had a really close relationship. There's this podcast is proudly sponsored by Build in Public University, a safe place to promote your content the way you want to promote it. There's things that he knows about me that people in my family have no clue about. Right. Because he's an OG. He was OG to the core, and and we had so much fun going on. Our father, son, he was just such a fucking cool person. <laughs> like in terms of like sitting with him in a basketball game, that was my favorite. Like it literally was my favorite. Sitting, watching him, it, it, watching him watch basketball is fun because he's he knows. Well, he's a huge West Virginia. He went to West Virginia University in Virginia. Gotcha. So UVA law school and then undergrad West Virginia. Now, but he depending on whoever's like doing the, the best plays before they happen. He's smart that's, about basketball. Right. Like, he's smart. That's <laughs> like he knew. He, yeah. But like, yeah. if it wasn't for my friends, if it wasn't for my job, you have this. All these people that are, they're they're here for you too. They are, are here for you. And, and when they when are. these things and 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 but to anybody who who watches his 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 uh platforms, like, he's here for you too. You know, I mean, like, we should all just be there for each other. And like, we the 100%. one thing that was weird is we didn't have a funeral. And he wanted to be buried in West Virginia. So we cremated it and we were going to go up to West Virginia when it was pleasant. And my, 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 some people in my family just couldn't handle like the big funeral. People coming up and hugging and saying, like, we couldn't handle it. We, it was such a big loss for us that like we needed, we just wanted to be alone. And I know that was selfish because some people wanted no, to reach out. No, it's not but then, selfish. But then I went, to, I went to like, this, then this happened, and this kind of was weird. Um, every time I go out, or if I'm at work, and like I went to a friend of mine's wedding, so I saw a bunch of friends who, so I'm seeing people for the first time since this happened, and it still is occurring. 
and they're bringing it up. And really, we could have handled all this in one day at a funeral. And so, like, I'm out and about or going to a wedding, trying to celebrate my friend's wedding. And I'm not bringing my negative emotions or my sadness. I'm happy for my friend's wedding. Yeah, let's party and have fun. Um, it's what my dad would have wanted me to do and have fun, too. Yeah. Um, and and everybody had to, like, like mellow down for a second when they were talking to me and say, how are you? I'm so sorry about your dad. So it's like, man, I wish you could have gotten that all over within one day. That's the but at the same time, they all... At a, at a funeral, they're kind of like they have to say it, and and then the, out in the wild or in public or you know, people chose to come up to me and I'm, I was like, Lauren, how you been? How's your pop? how's your show going? It's going great. I, I'm hey, I'm so sorry about you, and I'm like, oh, wasn't he a cool dude? Fun, but I'm telling you this, for me, it was much more painful. This podcast has started a fundraising effort for Crisis Text Line. We have a goal of $19 per episode because $19 supports one person in their time of absolute crisis with their mental health. If you would like to donate through our fundraiser titled Lauren's Infinity, the link is in the episode's description. Lauren was my wife's best friend and loved by all who came into contact with her. It's more painful leading up to him passing away. When she told me he's gone and I was like, you mean he's good? Because no one's ever said he's gone. So like, I asked the dumbest question ever. And she said, yes. <laughs> no, all, of a sudden, question. all of a sudden, it wasn't like, okay, we're going to have to do this surgery. We're not going to, because like, it was, he just, was done. It was done. That's it. His body, you know, he, he fought for a long I, time. I don't know what it's like to stop ever. <laughs> Keep going. But, but you can't. That's, that's not, not life. That's not how life works. No, I know. And like, it, listen, I didn't lose my dad. No, I, you could have ended up, and I could have ended up in. We're both adopted. The like, most <laughs> sketchy situations. We could have ended up in 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 CPS or whatever yeah. child. You know, we could have ended up in adopted by a family who adopts kids just to get like you know their whatever fucking, money. Yeah, money. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, exactly. we, we we got the damn lottery ticket. We're two people. No, that we are the, the adoption ticket. lottery. And not just us. We have other friends that we graduated with. That like we have four or five friends that also won the lottery. And I'm not talking about like financial. I'm talking about love because I made sure that I was there all the time. I was like not all the time, but all the time I could be. And he knew that I loved him. He knew I'd do anything for him. Um, and he knew that I would do what he asked me to do. I'm just such the an way emotional treat- person. Like, like anything that comes up, it's like somewhat. It, it, that's the ADHD side of me that I can't stand. Is like one flows. one thing comes up that like I feel strongly about. I start crying, or I get mad. You latch on to that. Yeah, yeah. It, like, it, like because I don't know any other that's way to be. The definition of ADHD. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let me talk about emotions for a second. Anger is a strange emotion that I don't want anybody to ever entertain if they don't have to. What happens is we get our feelings hurt. But our human condition has kind of like prepared us or just instilled with us. If you hurt my feeling, you cut me off in traffic. What really happened was you hurt my feelings. But I skip that. We skip that. We don't allow ourselves to feel hurt. We go straight to anger. Now, anger is the same thing as filling your car up with gas, driving down a one-way road with no return at 180 miles an hour until it runs out of gas. You're angry the whole time. You're still going to be angry afterwards. What are you doing with that emotion? If you harness just that sadness before you entertain anger, you can just watch a movie. You could have you go out and watch a sunset and, and mellow with sadness. But anger. Sadness can be treated. Don't let sadness, don't skip sad. Like, I, allow I, I, sadness. I know, I, allow I sadness you, in like, because then you can probably contain that emotion that later becomes anger. Is, I don't want to be contained. Does it fuel you? A fuel you? To yes. Do other things? Yes. Because anger, that's a diff- like <laughs> anger, being yeah. angry. I'm talking about. A diff- I guess a different kind of anger. I'm talking about an anger where like somebody pisses you off and why? Yeah. That kind of anger. Oh, well, like, that's just different. allow yourself that's to totally have your feelings hurt yeah. first, but and then just chill. But like, but some sorts of anger when you are hurt drives you to help so many people. The anger and, inspired you to to yes. like to 
just you're not uh, angry like making these people feel better. You're, you're right, right. You're, no, you're no, no, not now. You, but yeah. anger started. Sure, but you had to get out of that. Yeah, you can't live no, your no, life being angry. So, like, absolutely. So, so and, like, that's... and and maybe going forth, like, like when somebody like offends you, don't get mad at them. Just let them be offended, be sad that they hurt your feelings, and then have a drink or <laughs> just watch something funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? And don't no. go to anger because when you no. go to anger, it's hard to turn that down. It is. It, you know, it you is. never know. But yeah. sadness, you can kind of flip that switch. The problem is Sometimes, not like, flip the switch. If anger wasn't so powerful. That's the thing. Anger to get shit done. Like anger can make you throw a glass against the wall. I've written a lot of cool things that I'm proud of it, it, when I was angry. Right. I've had a lot of ideas, that, a lot of jokes. That anger is a massively power, powerful emotion. I, get, this, I would get I, angry at myself I, when I, I mess up when I'm angry. Oh, if like, I mess something up and I, I say things to myself, if somebody heard what I was saying to myself and they thought I was talking to somebody else, yeah. Th- th- if I was cancelable, they they would cancel me. It. Like it's horrible. But like that's just me talking shit to myself. You know? I do the same. And like that's what I think everybody does. And like yeah. I think like people who are on the verge of losing a family member just need to make sure that they have not their affairs in terms of planning. Just make sure that everything's said that needs to be said, that, you know, that's constructive. You know, like, and just enjoy the time you have left with them. Like, like, like I made a point to like, like, like oh, dad's on the back porch. I'm going to go sit out there with him for 30 minutes. Not because I'm penciling them in, but because I love them and it's fun and I'm not going to have this forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it was fun. We the things we would say, the things we talk about. When we went to Europe in 2005, we went up five, just me and him, just to Amsterdam, and then to England. When, and then I studied in England for like five months. We went to Yosemite when I was like 13. He had some business out in California, and for like three days, he would drop me off at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I'm an aquarium freak. <laughs> like I love aquariums. I love a bird. Really? I, oh, I did not I, know that. I will, when I was in Nashville, I would drive to Chattanooga. By the way, the Chattanooga Aquarium is better than the Atlanta one. No shit. The one in Atlanta is great. It's great. But the one in Chattanooga, better. Plus Rock City. But aquariums are amazing. So I, he, he had business, so he dropped me off at the aquarium. And they had a lot of otters, and I was just sitting there enjoying it. Then we drove to up to San Francisco, hung out there, had a good time. Then we drove to Yosemite, and I'll never forget that trip, man. Like, yeah. So I'm not so like torn up, like mad and sad that I lost my dad. I'm so grateful that I had him and that we had those memories. We did all that. Guy, I am humbled today. Well, I'm humbled to know you, and humbled to know everybody. I mean, you're just a fucking good people. person. Man. I have a lot like, of fun with a lot of people. I know. No, we know each other really well, and that's the thing about my dad. He's an amazing person, and I'm so freaking happy that like he was my my dad and that i had him for the time i did so much more than i am sad that he's not here and i'm so happy to be here with you (laughs) 